Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. This segment, we're going to cover a few stories. We're going to talk about Israel bombing, sending a targeted strike into Lebanon. Now, it might not be as bad as you might think. They are quite happy with the results. Sticking with the Middle East, the United States has decided to send it, has attacked a part of Iran itself and targeted some militants that were there or they were starting to do drone strikes or something like that. We'll cover that. How that actually has a stronger significance than the Israel-Lebanon situation. There was a horrific attack in England yesterday and three children, unfortunately, are casualties. And the British uh, populace has had enough and they they went after the police today as they tried to stand in the way between them and a uh, a mosque. Turns out that the Fraser Institute has done a an analysis of our taxes in Canada, and, and we are spending more on taxes than we are on housing. If you can imagine that, forty three percent of our overall income is going directly into the pockets that does not include carbon tax. And Abacus data is showing us that the Quebec vote has the Conservatives and the Liberals tied. And now the bloc is way ahead, but the Conservatives and the Liberals tied could be an indication of one thing, and I'll cover that. All that's coming up. Before we get into it, I would encourage you all to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share this channel with all of your socials. I have an open GoFundMe and I have memberships if you wish to support the channel that way. Any support that you offer me, however, I appreciate. Okay, we're going to begin with the uh, attack in Lebanon from Israel on their website, on the X site of the Israeli Defense Force. Frode Shakur, the man who unalived 12 children on a soccer field on Saturday and responsible for 30 years of Hezbollah terrorist attacks, was the specific target that they sent this missile in after. Now, before you get worried that we're going to be drawing Lebanon into part of the conflict, that will be the last country to come into this conflict because it has a strong Christian population and they understand the, the nuances of the Middle East far better than you and I. In a targeted strike in Beirut, they, they hit a, cause in those regions, neighborhood, they neighborhood, right? So they know that all the people from from Islam live in that region and all the people that are inside of the various groups live in that particular neighborhood. So they know, right, where to send all of these. However, they are quite happy that they got them and they, uh, as you can see, they uh, did a little 46 second video. Targeted strike in it. Beirut, Lebanon. The IDF eliminated the man behind the Majdal Shams massacre, Fuad Shukel. Shukel was a senior military commander in Hezbollah and the head of the strategic unit, and in the past 30 years, he has been responsible for masterminding, planning, and executing every Hezbollah attack. He has a 5 million US dollar bounty issued by the US State Department on him, and he has the blood of civilians from all over the world on his hands. He was involved in numerous terrorist attacks, such as the U.S. Marine Corps barracks bombing that killed 241 American troops. His elimination that. brings us one step closer to restoring stability in this region and eliminating terrorists who threaten the lives of innocent civilians. We will take every step necessary to keep our civilians safe on all fronts. In a targeted strike in... Now, two things that you have to find interesting about that clip. First of all, the guy they were mentioning, I, I believe they have done a uh, movie about him. The guy that, that started Hezbollah, he's also the one that's responsible for that um, American barracks bombing. And secondly, this was all done in total English. So there was no, uh, you know, the audience that they're targeting is not Israeli. They're targeting individuals who live in the West that speak English. So that's something to think about when you are watching how they took the time to worry about your opinion, your public opinion on the matter. Sticking with the Middle East, Grok on X is reporting the U.S. strike in Iraq amid Middle East tensions. The United States carried a defensive airstrike in Iraq targeting militants preparing to launch a drone attack, according to U.S. officials. This action was taken in response to a threat against coalition forces occurring shortly after Israel struck Hezbollah in Lebanon. The strikes have heightened tensions in the Middle East, with various sources reporting on the events and their implications for regional security. 
this is a bigger deal than the Hezbollah strike. The Hezbollah strike in will upset Hezbollah in Lebanon, but it will not get the Lebanese military, the military of Lebanon, um, marshalling any more than it already is. It's a very tense country, and because they have so many, uh, like the they have a lot of Christians in there. It's one of the biggest Christian populations in the Middle East. So they're in, involved in government, and they will take this strike from Israel and say one thing. And, but if Israel does 20, that'll be a different story. But this one, okay, you got the guy. Don't do it again. Everybody washes everybody's hands, and everybody's happy. In Iran, however, will be very unhappy. The idea that the Americans will have yet again launched a strike. The Iranian issue becomes much bigger because Iran is in bed with Russia. So Russia is supplying all of the really top-notch protection for Syria. There's a lot of possibility for that to flare up if Iran decides that they want to get, you know, offended by the United States dropping yet another surgical strike right into their country inside of their own borders. Up to now, they'd all been fighting it out in Syria, as far as I can tell. So it'll be interesting to keep an eye on. I don't know that Iran necessarily has much of an air force, but they do have quite a bit of um, Navy that causes a lot of problems for the global oil. And they may elect to strike back that way. I don't know. Okay, so yesterday in England, a horrible, horrible, disgusting, vile human being attacked children. And tragically, three of them were lost. Now, I don't know where in his mind he thinks he's being some sort of a man or a hero or anything like that. I don't really want to go into the mind of this individual. I can tell you that the ramifications have begun. And breaking news riots are breaking out across Southport, which is where these poor little children, and they were all under 10. After another attempt, attack at a vigil was stopped. Two-tier policing won't work. They're pushing back. These guys don't care of what name you want to call them. They just, they're upset, they're fed up, and this is the thing that I've been trying to tell people, since who, anybody who will listen. Tommy Robinson has a different angle of, of basically the same issue. Now, let's just look at what we got here. We got a bunch of women standing behind, behind the guys. Everybody's holding up nightsticks. Apparently the riot police showed up, but they couldn't get past the bodies of, of people that were there. And I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, there's no excuse that I will accept. I don't want to hear about any of their, any of their excuses, but nonetheless, there it is. I'm reporting on it and it probably will get worse long before it gets better. Okay. Moving on to the another story before I become so upset that I can't complete it. The Fraser Institute has released a report today detailing how Canadians pay more in taxes than they do for the necessities of life. Taxes versus the necessities of life, life the Canadian Consumer Index 2024 edition. Taxes versus the necessities of life, the Canadian Consumer Tax Index of 2024. Now, it's just a little snippet. I could take the whole article, but the point is still the same. You can see here how the average Canadian family pays 43% of their income to taxes more than the necessities of life, which they're guesstimating to be about 38%. They put clothing at 2%. They don't put entertainment in that breakdown. And when you look at 43 and you add to it all of the other three numbers, which are, uh, like I said, 36 you're at 79%. So 79% of your income covers taxes and necessities, leaving you very little money to save, little room to shop for entertainment, that kind of stuff. And the median income that they're using for this um, study is in 2023, the average Canadian family earned an income of $109,235 and paid total taxes equaling $46,988 or 43%. In 1961, the average family had an income of five grand and paid a total tax bill of $1,675, which is 33%. 
but they're saying that based on $109,000 and they use the word family. So I'm thinking that they're claiming it out as two income and it's not including the carbon tax. So the outside expenditures are going to chew up that last 21% really rapidly. And the liberal government thinks that you're doing just fine, that you're going to elect them, that you're very happy. And I think that we're being taxed into oblivion. And I, for one, think that it's time we people like we, now you understand what Pierre Polyev means when he says you're going to start to reward hard work because you're going to work and your whole, you're not, you're not earning any, like you're not gaining anything, right? You're, you're covering your bases and you're paying your taxes and what's left over. There's very little left over when you could think about the amount of um, luxuries that people want to go after, right? It seems to me that it's time for Canadians to stop paying so much in taxes or at least if we're paying nearly 50% of our income to taxes, let's have a hospital that works. Let's have schools that work. Let's have everything operating, uh, you know, tickety-boo. Okay, so in the last segment, I want to talk about the Abacus poll and that was released recently about the polling numbers of the various political parties and the leaders. Now, in one segment of that, they had one done by region, committed vote intention by province region. British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces. What's interesting, what's kind of exciting is the Quebec one where it's showing the Liberals and the Conservatives basically neck and neck with the NDP pulling up 10% and the Green at 4%, the People's Party and the Bloc. Now, the Bloc's at 36%. So when you, if you have familiar with Quebec politics, they will always vote for the Quebec, the Bloc when they are upset with the Liberals. They've been doing it so often that there was a time when the Bloc, the, a party that wants to destroy Canada as it exists in its current form, was the leader, was the official opposition. That's how much sway Quebec has in, in, a, in the federal elections. What is interesting is the 24% that the Conservatives and the Liberals and the riding, the by-election that was just announced in September 16, because it's Verdun and LaSalle. And if you don't know the region of Montreal that I'm talking about, you will need to understand that it is one of the English regions of Montreal. And if you're not from there, that's significant. Just trust me when I tell you, it's an English region and it's significant because they will never vote for the Bloc. Never. They would not vote for the Bloc Quebecois because they see the Bloc as separatists. And unless you've lived in Quebec, you don't understand the significance of the words that I'm using. But I assure you in Verdun and LaSalle, they know the word, like they, those words are quite significant. There's a lot of attack on the English in Quebec and they've been going at them since 1973. So when you have a, there's a lot of grandfather clauses and when you have a regions like La Salle and Verdun that are predominantly English, they will not vote for the bloc. So what does that leave that this region, this by-election is coming up on September 16? That leaves an opening for Quebec to, or excuse me, for the conservatives to take a seat, to take a seat in Verdun and La Salle away from the liberal who is so confident he handpicked the person running in that region, Trudeau did. I didn't realize that the polling was so close. And I'm not saying to you that the conservatives can take seats all over the province because they're not going to be able to do that. But in, their, in an English region of Montreal, they may very well be, willing, be able to do that if they just listen to the politics of the region. If they listen to the to the politics that are currently going on right now in Quebec, it's really bad for the language laws and people that are just trying to go about their day and who are being targeted because they don't speak French or because they prefer to speak English inside of their house are going to probably be willing to listen to someone if they're willing to defend their constitutional rights and rights that have been upheld by the Supreme Court rights, but that have been upheld by everybody except the elected governments of Quebec. Uh, I'll do a different video on it if you want me to on the, on the, what can only be described as the outright war on the English language in the province of Quebec. In this one though, I just want to say that it would be interesting to have a conservative win that seat of the by-election if for no other reason than to make the liberals understand just how, what shaky ground they might be on. I don't, 
I mean, you need to appreciate that without Quebec, the Liberal Party loses a lot of seats. Now, if you lose, if they lose Quebec and they lose Toronto, they're going to have about as many seats as the NDP currently does. But there's a lot of that can happen between now and then. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you next time.